Hello! Today I will talk about US cotton market, its main demand and supply drivers. I begin with an overview of global cotton production and consumption trends in the last 60 years. Cotton is primarily used to make clothing. It is a natural textile fiber that comes from a cotton plant. Cotton needs warm and humid climate. Its cultivation area is 30 degrees south and north from the equator, which covers a fairly large area in multiple countries. Worldwide use of cotton has been growing at 1.4% annually during 1960-2020. Its consumption peaked in 2007, but has been on a slight decline since then. It was the most used fiber until about late 1970s, when cheaper synthetic fibers took the lead. In per capita terms, global consumption of cotton has decreased between 1960-2020 by 12%. In contrast, use of non-cotton fibers increased by 484% between 1960-2020. During 2018-2022, Global cotton production has been around 25 million metric tons. In 2021-22, seven countries produced 83% of world's cotton. They include China, India, US, Brazil, Australia, Pakistan, and Turkey. During the period 2018 to 2022, China and India have accounted for more than half of the world's cotton domestic use. The largest exporter of cotton is the United States, 34%, followed by Brazil, 18%. The largest importers of cotton are Bangladesh, China, Vietnam, Turkey, and Pakistan, comprising 76%. I continue by discussing U.S. cotton production in primary uses. Cotton grows well in warm and dry climate. In U.S., cotton is grown in 17 states. Two main species of cotton are cultivated for commercial use, upland and pima cotton. Pima is a higher-end product, and it is usually almost double the price of upland. In 2021, 98% of all cotton produced in the United States was upland cotton. Cotton is planted in March to June, and harvested from August to December. The largest producer of cotton is Texas, representing 44% of total U.S. cotton production. Five states account for 73% of all cotton production in U.S. They are Texas, Georgia, Arkansas, Mississippi, and North Carolina. Most of the cotton crop is used to make apparel, about 75%, home furnishings, 18%, and for use in industrial products, such as cotton swabs. Cotton plants make cotton fibers and cottonseed oil and meal. Oil is used in human consumption in cooking. Meal is used for animal feed and fertilizer. I will spend the next minute or so explaining the multi-fiber agreement knowledge of which will be important later in the presentation. The MFA refers to a set of textile trade agreements between countries that were in effect from 1974 to 1994. The goal of MFA was to protect domestic textile industries in developed countries, such as United States and Western Europe, by setting textile import quotas from developing countries that have much lower labor costs. As expected, the agreements raised domestic textile prices in developed countries. U.S. had 40 bilateral export restraint agreements by 1994. In 1994, MFA agreements were terminated, but it took another 10 years to phase out all restrictions. Once MFA quotas went away, U.S. cotton textile and apparel imports from developing countries skyrocketed. Look at the graph. China 
India and Pakistan's share of all cotton textile and apparel imports increased from 24% in 1989 to 51% in 2021. There are two cotton prices I will use. First is the farm price reported by USDA, a weighted average for both upland and Pima cotton. Second, the Cotlook A index, which is an average of the five cheapest cotton price quotations available for trade around the world. Graph on the right shows these two cotton prices for the period 1975 to 2020. The world cotton price is more expensive than U.S. farm price due to transportation costs. But overall, the two prices tend to move together. The only notable difference is a dramatic spike in world cotton price in 2010 as a result of increased demand from China, drawn down global stocks of cotton and floods in places such as Pakistan. When trying to estimate how the prices of cotton will behave, one needs to analyze the factors that affect its demand and supply. A market price is determined by an intersection of demand and supply curves. The price can change when demand or supply curve move in or out. The components of cotton supply are beginning stocks, production, and imports. Beginning stocks are what is carried over from the previous year. Production is determined by the amount of acreage harvested and the yield per acre. U.S. does not import cotton. Demand for cotton comes from domestic mills that spin cotton into thread or yarn, exports, and ending stocks. U.S. exports a lot of cotton. In 2020-2021 marketing year, it exported 74% of its total U.S. demand. Table summarizes the main demand and supply effects on cotton prices. On the demand side, we have international trade, price of cotton substitutes, and organic cotton demand. On the supply side, we have technological changes, weather, and government support programs. I describe each in detail next. The first demand factor I discuss is U.S. international cotton trade. Cotton demand comes from two main sources, domestic mill use and exports. Over time, U.S. cotton industry went from being domestically to world-driven once trade barriers such as quotas were lowered and cheaper cotton clothing imports started to dominate the domestic market. Graph on the left shows that total cotton use has varied year to year, but has had a positive trend between 1975 and 2020. Global population growth is one driver for increased cotton demand, as people need more clothing. U.S. exports share has increased from 31% in 1975 to 87% in 2020. This means that in the recent decade, U.S. cotton demand has been largely driven by world cotton demand, and in particular, by what has been happening in the economies of its major cotton trading partners. Bar chart on the right shows top four export markets for U.S. cotton between 2015 and 2021. China and Vietnam are the largest importers of U.S. cotton. For example, there is an ongoing trade war with China. In 2018, U.S. imposed tariffs on imports of solar panels, washing machines, aluminum, and steel from selected trading countries, including China. In response, many countries, including China, imposed a retaliatory tariff on some products. Prior to the trade war, China already had a quota on U.S. cotton imports at a lower duty rate and a 40% import duty on all imports above the quarter. As a result of U.S. tariffs, China imposed an additional 25% tariffs 
on all U.S. cotton imports starting in June 2018. This led to a decrease in cotton imports. USDA estimated that annual U.S. losses from retaliation tariffs implemented by different trading partners like EU, Turkey, China, and other spread across 17 different commodity groups, totaled $13.2 billion. The cotton losses amounted to just 3% of $366 million. China was the only one who implemented additional tariffs on cotton. China's cotton imports increased in 2020 and 2021 due to economic recovery following COVID-19 pandemic and a new process to claim exemption from 25% tariff for domestic companies that import U.S. cotton. Another demand driver is the price of substitutes. Total U.S. textile imports have been growing over time. As was explained earlier, end-of-multi-fiber agreements spurred growth in textile imports due to lower production costs outside U.S. Cotton and synthetic materials, such as polyester and rayon, comprise an average 91% of all textile imports during 1989 to 2021. Graph on the left shows that the share of cotton has declined from 47% in 1989 to 43% in 2021, whereas the share of synthetic textile imports increased from 36% in 1989 to 49% in 2021. One reason behind high synthetic imports is its price. Synthetic fibers, such as polyester, are cheaper than natural fibers. The figure on the right compares the producer price index for cotton and synthetic textile product and apparel. We can see that cotton products are more expensive to make than synthetic. Cotton price index has been much higher starting in 2014, which coincides with the time when volume on synthetic textile imports overtook cotton imports. The last factor I will talk about is demand for organic cotton. As the graph on the left shows, the U.S. organic cotton production has been growing in recent years. However, as of 2021, it only accounted for 0.3% of all cotton production in the United States. Texas is the main producer of organic cotton. Other states include Arizona, California, and New Mexico. Much higher prices for organic over conventional cotton continue to be lucrative for the farmers. Nearly 85% of all domestically grown organic cotton was used in non-woven materials, thin cotton balls, and remains in the U.S. Despite increase in organic production, there is not enough to meet the demand, which continues to be strong. Pie chart on the right shows that India and Turkey are the largest producers of organic cotton in the world. Sustainable fashion is the primary driver for organic cotton. With climate change happening, more and more companies are looking for ways to have a positive impact on the environment to appeal to its customers. In addition, multiple surveys indicate that customers are willing to pay more for sustainably produced goods. Use of pesticides in conventional cotton production has led to a decrease in effectiveness of pesticide use, toxicity to bees, poor soil quality, and water contamination. A switch to an organic cotton production can mitigate many of these detrimental effects. For example, crop rotation, alternating planting of cotton with cereal rye, lentils, and chickpeas can improve soil quality. Planting trap plants, such as okra and sunflowers, can help with pest management. Moving on to the supply side. Similar to other U.S. crops, most of the cotton is genetically engineered. G cotton was commercially introduced in the United States in 1995, and adoption rates increased rapidly in the years that followed. 
GE seeds have accounted for the majority of cotton acres since 2000, expanding from 61% of acreage that year to 96% in 2020. GE seeds can be herbicide tolerant HT, insect resistant BT, or stacked that combine both. HT seeds allow farmers to better control weeds. A farmer can use herbicides to kill weeds, but not damage HT crops. This way, no tilling the soil is needed, which is very labor intensive. BT seeds have a gene that produces a toxin to specific insects and protects the plant over its lifetime. Most of the cotton seeds planted are stacked, meaning they contain both HT and BT traits. One of the benefits of GE seeds is increased yields because of reduced yield loss due to insects and weeds. A 2002 USDA study found that cotton yields in Southeast United States increased because of HT and BT seeds. In 1997, a 10% increase in HT cotton acreage led to a 1.7% increase in yield, and a 10% increase of BT cotton acreage led to a 2.1% increase in yield. More recent study from Mexico confirmed increased yields due to G cotton seeds. Weather is still a primary driver for the cotton yields. Climate change is expected to bring more intense and prolonged extreme weather events, such as longer droughts, heavier floods. Even though cotton thrives in the hot climate, it still needs irrigation, especially in the beginning of a growing cycle. We saw an impact a drought had on decreased cotton and other agricultural commodities in 2011. Texas produced on average 32% of all U.S. cotton between 1975 and 2020. Graph on the right shows that 2011 was the driest year in Texas history during 1975 to 2020. The drought in 2011 led to a drop of upland cotton production by 55%, from 7.9 million bales in 2010-2011 to 3.5 million bales in 2011-2012. The yield of upland cotton in Texas decreased by 16%, from 703 pounds per acre in 2010-2011 to 589 pounds per acre in 2011-2012. In contrast, favorable growing conditions such as timely rains, no late spring freezes, hot temperatures in the summer, and dry harvest conditions can dramatically improve yields and production. This is what happened in 2004, when growing conditions were at their best. Graphed on the left show that the cotton yield jumped 17% from 730 pounds per acre in 2003 to 855 pounds per acre in 2004. The last supply factor I will cover is the cotton government support programs. Cotton producers have access to several government support programs. Under Farm Bill 2018, cotton farmers have access to price loss coverage, agricultural risk coverage, stacked income protection plan, marketing assistance loan, and loan deficiency payment programs. PLC and ARC are subsidies that farmers can receive to offset lower revenues if commodity prices are lower than what was expected. Producers can only choose to participate in either PLC or ARC. PLC offers protection against a decline in the crop price, whereas ARC in the crop revenue. Farms not enrolled into PLC or ARC can purchase stacked income protection plan to ensure a portion of expected revenues. Farmers can also participate in MAL program, a version of which has been running for decades. MAL provides both a floor price and interim financing for certain commodities. 
The MAL offers producers short-term loans during harvest time, when market prices tend to be the lowest, allowing them to delay the sale of the commodity until market conditions improve. Farmers receive a nine-month non-recourse loan from a government by pledging some of their cotton crop as a collateral. Non-recourse means that USDA must accept the forfeited crop pledged as a collateral for full payment of an outstanding loan. If local market prices for the crop increase above the loan rate plus interest, a producer may repay the loan and reclaim the crop. If market prices remain below the loan rate, then other program options are available to producers, including repayment of the loan at a lower rate, for feature of the crop, or taking a loan deficiency payment in lieu of MAL. The figure on the right compares the loan rate with an average price received by the farmers for upland cotton. In most years, market prices are above the loan rates and farmers used MAL as a short-term liquidity until the sale of their crop. In others, like 1999 to 2001, cotton market prices were much lower than the low rate, leading to large crop for feeders and subsequently higher ending stocks. In some years, cotton government support was more restrictive as compared to other crops, such as corn and soy, because of the Brazil-US cotton case. This dispute was initiated by Brazil in 2002, who accused U.S. cotton support programs in depressing international cotton prices and thus unfairly reducing quantity and value of Brazil's cotton exports. Brazil is the second largest exporter of cotton after the U.S. In 2004, WTO found that indeed some of the U.S. agricultural support payments were inconsistent with WTO commitments, and some were found to be illegal. WTO findings concurred with Brazil's claims that U.S., by supporting its cotton farmers, has led to lower international cotton prices and distorted the world cotton market. WTO required U.S. to modify its cotton program to remedy the situation. As often happens, U.S. actions were not enough, and so dispute continued until 2014. U.S. and Brazil finally reached an agreement to end dispute in 2014. As a result of this, the Farm Bill 2014 provided reduced benefits to cotton producers. For example, under Farm Bill 2014, PLC and ARC programs were created for all commodities except cotton. Stacks was created for cotton. ML benefits continued for cotton, but at the reduced loan rate. The new marketing loan rate for upland cotton is to be calculated as a simple average of the adjusted world price for the two preceding marketing years, within the range of 45 to 52 cents per pound, down from a fixed 52 cents per pound in 2008 farm bill. As you can see, using this methodology, the loan rate decreased to 49 cents per pound in 2017. I would like to conclude by talking about cotton price and its stocks to use ratio. This is a common relationship used to analyze how the commodity's equilibrium price changes in response to supply and demand. Stocks to use ratio is calculated by dividing the ending stocks by total use. Total use for cotton is the sum of cotton used in the domestic meals and exported. Ending stocks is defined as what is left from total cotton supply for the year after subtracting total cotton use. Changes in ending stocks are inversely related to price. If total use rises relative to supply, ending stocks decline and price increases and vice versa. Figure presents a scatter plot of annual cotton farm prices versus stocks to use ratio. As expected, 
lowest stocks to use ratios are associated with higher prices, whereas increase in stocks to use ratio leads to lower prices. Thank you for listening, and I hope you watch my other commodities basics videos.